Jesus versus the demons. Is there really such a thing as a demon? Some ask. Not a Georgia Tech demon deacon. Or Duke Blue Devil. But a genuine devil, a genuine demon. Many moderns quickly retort that science has done away with all such superstition. But science cannot answer that question. It's ill-equipped for that. Can't even really broach the subject of spiritual realities. What test would science offer to examine the question of spiritual existence? No, rather it would have to be logic, which would point to the necessity of a spiritual realm as the sufficient cause for the creation of the physical realm. It would be multiplied human testimony which would give quantifiable evidence for research in this subject. More importantly, it would be revelation itself from God that would be most decisive on the subject. Infallible scripture, of course, does inform us of the reality of these beings. You guys know Halloween is quickly approaching. And right on their annual cue, many folks are making light of the powers of darkness and of death and things associated with death and evil things. They have their comical and entertaining displays of ghosts and witches, skeletons and skulls, zombies and warlocks and crystal balls and whatnot. And just for a change in their entertainment, they decide not to go bowling or other things, but go to haunted houses and cemeteries and very scary movies. Christians, of course, are rightly leery of all of this. What's more, we need to understand that there is true destructive power in evil. There is a reality of evil, and it does destroy. It's not something we are to celebrate. Celebrate evil, celebrate death. Why? Why not celebrate goodness and celebrate life? Not even in the least should we celebrate these things. Christians also need to know that Christ's power over the darkness and over demonic activity is decisive. That's what we will read and discover today from the Gospel of Matthew, if you would turn there. We are not going to be in Matthew. We were in Matthew many years ago. But I just wanted to touch on this text in Matthew 8, just for today, to ponder a subject we haven't talked about in a while. Matthew 8, the end of that chapter, verses 28 through 34. I'm going to read it, and we're going to learn some things here from this text. When he, that is Jesus, came to the other side of the lake, into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed, met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. And they cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. The demons began to entreat him, saying, If you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. And they came out and went into the swine. And the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. The herdsmen ran away and went to the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniacs. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him... They implored him to leave their region. If we'd been in Matthew for a while and you read backwards, you'd note that the previous narrative revealed Jesus' power over nature, where he stilled the sea simply by speaking to it and it obeyed his mouth. This passage, coming next, demonstrates Jesus' authority not just over nature but over the spirit world. Keep in mind the gospel of Matthew's theme, and that is that Jesus is the king. He is the Jewish king, and any king, by its definition, must have authority over the realm of his kingdom. Jesus has that. 
And revealing the greatness of Christ's authority as king is really the key to each passage in the gospel. Previously, if we had been reading backwards, we would have noted in chapter 7, verse 29, that Jesus, when he taught the Sermon on the Mount, he taught with such great authority, people noted that. This man speaks with authority, and they were not used to that. He would heal sicknesses by his own authority, speak to them, and the disease was gone. He speaks, as we noted already, to the wind and to the waves. Who talks to the wind and to the waves? And they obeyed him. Authority. Authority over all things. Now he speaks to the demons who are subject to him, and we see that they have to obey. That's comforting to us. What exactly is a demon? Well, they are evil spirits. That's what they are. The word demon is used interchangeably in our New Testament with the designation evil spirit. However, unlike what many think, demons are not the spirits of deceased evil people. Thank goodness for that. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 23, it indicates that when evil people die, they do not turn into demons. They go off to Hades and they receive suffering confinement. Rather, the Bible describes demons as fallen angels. Fallen angels. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, it indicates that demons have a ruler named Beelzebul, another name for the devil. In Matthew 25, 41, it refers to the devil and his angels, bad angels, fallen angels, evil spirits. They fell with him from their original holy position given to them by God at creation. But now demons are presently loose. They are free to move about. And yes, they harass and deceive the human race. They enjoy doing that. Other demons who are not free are currently bound in a place Scripture calls Tartarus, a kind of a prison for spirit beings awaiting their ultimate judgment day. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 speaks of those angels who are bound. How you bound and bind and hold and restrict the spirit being, I don't know, but they are bound. Luke 8.31 refers to demons who are currently confined to the pit. Also, Revelation 9.2 indicates that these demons down in the pit will one day be released during that seven-year tribulation period in the future to perform all kinds of wicked deeds that they have been waiting to do. But our Jesus, whom we worship here today, is greater than all of them. May I hear an amen? amen? That's a good starting point. We just need a punctuation point right there. He's greater than all of them. Our precious Jesus. Out in the wilderness, Satan threw his very best temptations at the king, and Jesus just simply used the word of God, stood his ground, and the devil had to leave him, right? 1 John 3, 8 says that the Son of God appeared into this world for this very purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. The devil was doing works with his angels. Jesus appeared. His mission was to destroy the devil's works. He's come as a warrior, and he is going to beat the devil. If these disciples were left in the boat wondering, what kind of a man is this that he commands even the winds and the waves and they obey him, the demons give the answer to their question in this text when they cry out, he is the son of God. And they know more than the disciples know. I think sometimes they know more than we know. We need to be aware of these things and that's why we're preaching this today. We see here that Jesus as the Son of God has authority over the spirit world. We should rest in that authority and know he's the final victor and not have anything to do with these evil things. That's really the crux of today's message. There are three stages in this uh, contest, we'll call it, between Jesus and the demons. And we'll work through these three stages. There's first the possession by the demons in verse 28, then the power of Jesus, verses 29 and following, the plea for the, from the people in verses 33 and 34. Let's look first at the possession by the demons. There in verses 28 uh, through 31, I guess we'll go. The possession by the demons. Let's read that again. When he came to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs, and they were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. They cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd 
of many swine feeding at a distance from them. And the demons began to entreat him, saying, If you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. We'll stop there. This is the possession by the demons. The setting of this narrative is near the eastern shore of the Lake of Galilee. The disciples and Jesus just took a memorable trip, as we noted, where Jesus stilled the storm. Now they've landed on the other side, what Matthew calls the country of the Gadarenes. That's also the area that's known as the Decapolis, the Ten Cities, which was largely inhabited by Gentiles. There were some Jews sprinkled in, but it was a Gentile area. The first encounter that they have after landing the boat, pulling it to shore, was two demon-possessed men came running towards Christ. Now Mark and Luke in the parallel accounts mentioned that there was one man. They don't say only one man. They don't give any further comment. You put them two together. Obviously Matthew is providing a little more detail. There was one man in particular, but there was another man with him. Matthew's account mentions that they were coming out of the tombs. That doesn't mean that they were raised from the dead. That means they were living in the tombs, probably in the rooms in these big tombs associated with that area cut into the rock. The city people there nearby would have nothing to do with them, and the tombs, of course, provided some shelter for them to live. But their association with these tombs also pointed to their association with uncleanliness. Being around dead bodies in Old Testament law made one ceremonially unclean, at least in the Jews' mind. And Of course, we can imagine that uh, demons would enjoy dwelling anywhere where there was something profane or dirty. They would enjoy celebrating death. Think about that. We shouldn't be celebrating death. That's a demonic activity. We don't celebrate that. That's not fitting for saints. At least one of the men was naked too, according to Mark chapter 5 and Luke 8. We also learn from all three accounts that they were extremely violent. Mark 5 and Luke 8 say they, were, they could even break the chains that held them. In other words, they possessed supernatural strength. Nobody could contain them. By the way, you know, we wonder how was it that Samson had power to do all the things that he did. Well, here one spirit indwells just an ordinary man and he has power to break chains. It's pretty amazing. Well, of course, God's spirit could empower a man like Samson even, even more than that. In fact, this is so violent. They were so, no, so well known and so violent that they posed a problem. Nobody could even pass by that way. It must have been an important way to go past these tombs, some kind of a, a journey there, and they couldn't get past it. They had the habit of rushing out upon people and probably beating them up, and travelers had to beware. It was really tormenting the whole community. It was a serious community problem. It was also a serious personal problem for these men. Mark 5, 5 mentions that at least one of the men was a threat to himself. The demons would often torment him, and he would rush way out into the desert. The demons would also force the men to gash themselves with stones. And so they were sometimes bloody and out of control. And probably whenever they were in their right mind or could think somewhat of their own selves, they were terribly frightened. Please notice that demon possession has two necessary features here. If you want to know what demon possession is as opposed to demon oppression the possession is when they actually live inside the first mark of demon possession is the demon has entered into the host body and now resides inside that person remember that demons are localized spirits that can't be in multiple places at one time the second mark of a demon possessed person is control they control the person's will can control his mind and thus control his voice, control his muscles, where he goes, what he says, what he does. Again, I would ask you, does that sound like something that is worth celebrating? Whether someone was a Christian or not, does that sound like something that is reasonable to celebrate? Not at all. Here you have one of the most wretched of all descriptions in Holy Scripture of the effects of demon possession on human beings. The cruel abuse of these spirits tormented these poor humans. They had control over them to drive them to all this self-abuse, gashing themselves, screaming out in torment, wandering naked in the desert, unclean living in utter shame. Obviously, along with that, we could throw in other things that would go with that. Complete financial ruin, no friends, no family, right, that would be with them. It's reasonable to conclude that in time, once these demons had a little made a little sport of these poor fellows, that they would drive them to total self-destruction, lead them to suicide, and then off, off to the torments of Hades and hell following this life. That is what evil spirits do. That's what they want. That's their fun. That's their entertainment, if we can even say it that way. 
They destroy humanity. They like it. Hey, what do you get up to do in the morning? You have certain things you like to do. They get up in the morning, so to say. Let's go find someone and mess up their life. Let's bring pain. That's what evil does. Evil is destructive. Evil is, evil is erosive. Evil, evil tears down. King Saul in the Old Testament had an evil spirit. What did that evil spirit do? Make him happy? No, it tormented him. 1 Samuel 16, 4. People dabble with evil. They think it's exciting. They want a little taste of supernatural power, and they have no idea what they're touching. Matthew 15, 22 records that a Canaanite woman, a Gentile woman, remember they worship foreign gods, and there's a clue as to how people become demon-possessed. A Canaanite woman asked Jesus, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Cruelly demon-possessed. Some connection with false worship led to her daughter giving a, 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 a go-ahead for that demon to enter into her daughter. And now, as they realize the results of that, it's cruel to her daughter and she's begging for mercy to Christ. Notice next, as Jesus approached, what do these spirits drive these men to do? Verse 29 says that they clearly recognize Jesus. No problem there. When we combine that with the other accounts in Mark and Luke, we see that Jesus was already telling these demons to come out of the men, or the demon to come out of the men. And that's why they ran out of the tombs. They fell down before Jesus, and they actually begged Jesus for mercy. Get the picture. Now, what the 12 disciples spending months and months with Jesus were not able to completely figure out by this time, could not see because Christ in his deity, all of that was veiled with his humanity, right? Jesus looked like a normal man. The spirits immediately perceived, and they strongly reacted to it. They cried out, what business do we have to do with each other? Notice that reaction. Now, that's actually a pretty good question. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says that Christ has nothing in common with Belial. There's no connection there. There's nothing in common. So it's a good question. Their question indicates they know that they should have no dealings with Jesus whatsoever. Again, this is a good reminder to saints that we should have nothing to do with evil, right? Nothing to do with evil. Mark indicates that they came and they bowed down before Jesus. This was not voluntary, loyal worship, was it? The, we know that evil spirits hate Christ. They don't want anything to do with Christ. They bowed down because they recognized what? His authority. They had to. He's king. He has authority over the spiritual realm. They know that. His word commands their destiny. They came, they ran, and they bowed down. They feared God. They feared God's son. They feared God's power. You know James chapter 2, verse 19 says, right? You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe in what? Shudder. They shudder. It's not a contest, really, is it? Jesus and the demons. It's not a contest. They shudder. Evil spirits don't want anything to do with the Holy Son of God. They're evil. He's holy. They hate even being around Him. But these demons cried out, calling Jesus the Son of God. Mark and Luke say they called Him Son of the Most High God. They understood. This is, this is a unique being. The Son of the Most High God. They got it. Now, some interpret this as the demons trying to gain mastery over Jesus by saying his name. We know you. We know your name. Your name is. I don't think so. I think that they were forced to say this by his mere authoritative presence. Because next, they say to Jesus, have you come here to torment us before the time? They're, they're not, they're not going to get any mastery over him. Now, this, this question here that they ask Jesus is a fascinating statement. And uh, I want to think about this a minute. Uh, it gives us a little bit of insight into demon thinking. Now, maybe you don't want any insight into demon thinking, and that's just fine. I understand that. But it really is an insight. What do demons think? Here's an insight. First, notice that they're cowards. You see that? They're cowards. They were more willing, more than willing, I should say, to torment these poor men. But then when it came to their own torment, they're like, what? Have mercy on us. They're cowards and hypocrites. 
In Luke 8, 31, it says they were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. To them, that was the worst word, the abyss. Say, what is the abyss? I don't know. They don't like it. It must be very bad. Some terrible prison house for demons. Second, please notice their limited knowledge. Do you see that? They don't really understand what Jesus was doing down there on earth. Why have you come here? Maybe that means to this area of the land as well. But they don't know. What's he up to? What's he doing? They're not in the know. What's your mission? I don't know. Notice third, their awareness of their future torment in judgment. Somehow they got the word. There is a time of torture and torment that is coming. They know that is in their future. Hell, that's where they're headed, and they know it. In fact, Jesus himself confirmed this in Matthew 25, 41. He called the lake of fire the eternal fire, a place that had been prepared by God for who? The devil and his angels. It was made because of their rebellion. They know that. They're aware of that. It's accurate to say that hell was made for demons. It's accurate. Fourth, notice that they also thought they were free to have some fun now. Jesus was imposing on their haunting, ruining their fun, getting in the way of their agenda. This was not good for demons. Jesus' presence threatened with judgment. And they've said it, this is premature. You shouldn't be here. It's not time. Have you come to torment us before our time? It's not fair. They asked. That word time actually means occasion or season. They felt they had some right to argue their case to Jesus. Isn't that interesting? It was not the right time to be tormented. What are you doing here with us? We still are allowed to move about. We're still allowed to have some haunting fun. We're allowed to do things upon the earth. They even made bold a request to go into the pigs. Now, with this, the scriptures agree. Jude, uh, Jude verse uh, 6, it's only one chapter in Jude. It says, angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, God has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. They know it's coming. Some of the angels are bound, fallen angels. They know a judgment is coming. And it's a time of torment and torture. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. Didn't we just sing that? Didn't we just sing that? Lo, his doom is sure, right? That he's going to hell. There's a verse that says that. Was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Where the, the head of the angels goes, so the other angels will go as well, the fallen ones. Now, you wonder that if they knew that they would be judged by God so severely, why did they choose to oppose God? And then, of course, the answer simply is that they just hate God. They just hate God. They're going to take whatever time that they have before their judgment to hate God, hate God's people, hate the nation of Israel, which ultimately is God's chosen nation, hate us, hate our church, hate you, hate me, hate the Word of God, hate the preaching of the Word of God, Hate you when you go out and evangelize and talk about the gospel. And just hate that. That's what they've dedicated themselves to do. It's pretty simple. Anything that's holy, they want to profane. That's what they do. You know, sometimes you might say it's insane. Of course it's insane. That's, that's what evil is, insanity. Insanity and evil ultimately land in the same place, don't they? Now, the other Gospels indicate that the name of this demon was Legion. So you mean demons and angels have names? Yes, they do. In fact, Jesus adjured them by God, put them under oath, to tell him their name, according to Mark 5, verse 9. This one was called Legion. Why? Because he was not one. He was many. How many? We don't know. Uh, Mark indicates that there were 2,000 swine in that herd, and they all went rushing down. So I'm just figuring there was at least 2,000 of them. A legion for the, Roman, the Romans was 6,000 men. That's a whole bunch of demons, people. Now, obviously, the amount of space in a human being's body is not the issue. And there were multiple personalities in this person, obviously. 
Nor is the idea of multiple possession, many demons in one person, that is, unusual. Evidently, they like to gang up. We know that seven demons were taken out of a lady named Mary Magdalene, according to Mark 16, 9. In Luke eleven twenty six, 26, it speaks of demons who regularly bring along their friends to re-inhabit a person. They go out, they didn't find a place, they gather up some more friends that are worse than them, and they come back and they inhabit the same one they went out from. Demon possession is real. Multiple demon possession is real. But how does one identify it? How, how does one know if somebody is demon-possessed? Someone walking around crazy, are they demon-possessed? How do you know that? What are the indicators? Some people claim that gross, immoral, or irrational activity proves the work of demons in a person's life. But I would say this, first of all, that human beings have enough depravity in their own flesh to do some pretty gross things. Demon possession is beyond normal human depravity, okay? How do we know? Well, here is something that might surprise you. Most demon possession did not need any special discernment at all to figure it out. No special gift of discernment was needed to know if someone was demon-possessed. Even unbelievers who didn't even have the Spirit of God in their life could recognize that person, is spirit, that person has a demon in them. It took no supernatural sight. This whole town, in fact, knew that these two men were demon-possessed even before they came down to Christ. In Mark 7, 24, the Syrophoenician woman knew that her daughter was demon-possessed. In Matthew 17, all the people could tell that the boy was demon-possessed. He was throwing himself into the fire. He was crying out with, with certain voices. And you can see this pattern repeated in some of the other explanations of demon possession. There were no little hidden tests for demonization. You know, some people come along and say, I have the gift of discernment, and I can tell that that person is demon-possessed. Yeah. Now, I think we could all tell if they were demon-possessed, okay? So we're talking about demons here, okay? So what are the signs of demon possession? Well, just look at the obvious. One, ability to relate supernatural truths. We see that here. How about Acts chapter 16, 16, and 17? It says, the fortune-telling girl explained what Paul, the Apostle Paul, was doing on his evangelistic journey. That was supernatural knowledge. That's the satanic counterfeit to what we call prophecy. Satan always likes to counterfeit what we have. God has prophecy where he tells the future. Satan gets in there and he moves fortune-telling people to try to tell the future. That's satanic power. It's a counterfeit. And the spirit was so persistent that Paul had to cast out the spirit. Some call this today clairvoyance from French, clear vision, the ability to gain information about an object, a person, a location, or physical event through means other than the known senses. In other words, supernatural. We wonder where effective psychics get their ability, why Madame so-and-so is able to tell a person's fortune. Well, if she's not a con, then she has access to a familiar spirit. What does that mean? A demon. Number two, there is a marked increase in the person's strength. Now, this isn't in every case, but often it is. We see here again, able to break chains. That's not because his muscles all of a sudden got bigger. In Acts 19, it says that one man beat up seven others with the strength of a demon. A third way of noticing this is that they have self-destructive tendencies. We already mentioned that boy in Matthew 17 that kept throwing himself into the fire. Demons were trying to hurt the boy. Here, they're forcing the man to gash himself with stones. They're destructive. Fourth, there's often some gross or something immoral that's going on. After all, they're called unclean spirits. There could be swearing and cursing and blaspheming God's name. Anytime Jesus' name is mentioned, see how folks react. That might be an indication. There's just a compulsion to blaspheme the name of God. In fact, shouting and yelling and screaming is another mark of demon possession. Often as they would come out of the person that Christ was casting them out, they wouldn't come out without a fight and they would be letting out a scream or a screech. Fifth indication is that there's a radical change in the person's personality, maybe multiple personalities. Demons could control the voice and speak through a person. That means they controlled the brain by controlling the mind that sits on the brain, and then they would be able to dominate all of their actions and their tongues as well. The demons could eclipse the personality of the human, or they could choose not to, whatever they would want to do. And there's more we can learn about demons, but that may be 
is sufficient. Next, look at the bizarre request that these demons made to be sent into a herd of swine. Here we come to our second stage. We call this the power of Jesus. Verse 32, look at it. And he said to them, go. And they came out and went into the swine, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. The fact that they were going to be cast out and then they entered into the pigs, again, clearly demonstrates what demon possession is. In fact, when someone is demon possessed, often the way it's described in the New Testament is a person has, uses the verb for has, has a demon, possesses a demon, or the demon possesses him. Indwelling and control are the marks of possession. Now, the herd of swine was feeding at a distance, not immediately there. Remember, uh, this place is not Israel. This is a mostly Gentile region, and that's why there are a lot of swine there, because the Israelites considered the pigs to be unclean, right? Anyway, why did the demons make the request that Jesus would send them into the swine, and why would Jesus grant their request? That's interesting, isn't it? Couldn't the demons just leave and get away from Jesus and go into the pigs all by themselves? Evidently, not. Evidently, possession, either of human beings or of animals, is very difficult for demons. They can't just go willy-nilly landing on people and jumping in them. That ought to relieve you a little bit. <laughs> it appears, though they have great power, their power is limited. They have to gain permission to enter a host body. They can't just possess anyone they want, not even lowly animals. By the way, Christian, who lives inside of you? Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Where the Holy Spirit lives, don't let anyone tell you otherwise, no evil spirit can live. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. Now some interpreters theorize that the demons had a plan. They wanted to kill the pigs, and by killing the pigs, make all the townspeople who depended on the pigs angry at Jesus, and so drive Jesus out of there, and then he couldn't do his evangelistic work in that area. Now, I'm always skeptical of any interpretation that has demons out foxing the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think that's what happened. Evidently, they hated being outside of a host, and if it was the only thing they could do is to go into a pig, they knew, by the way, they couldn't ask Jesus, uh, if you're going to cast us out of this person, let us go in that person. They knew not even ask that question. So they just said, all right, the pigs. It was a, a lesser deal for them, but they'd take it. It was better than the abyss, better than floating around somewhere. They wanted a host. Evidently, they hate being outside of a host. Luke eleven twenty four 24 indicates that demons search for a place to inhabit it. It's not easy for them to find it, but they desire it. Luke 12, 40, that's, that's why you should not be the target for them, people. If you're outside of Christ, you know someone that's outside of Christ, and they're dabbling in false religion and the practices that go with that false religion, they're beginning to open up their lives to demonic activity, not necessarily possession, but certainly at immediately deception. And if they get further involved in those practices, then oppression, and then at some point in time, they're allowed possession. And that's the progress. Not for us that have the Spirit of God, but for those that do not and are not sure that they're saved. So they want to get in, but it's hard to find it. In Luke 12, 43 to 45, it shows that they would prefer to reside in bodies. They don't even want to be out in desert places, though they often go there. Bottom line is the pigs were preferable to the abyss. No abyss, please. Give us the piggies. This was their best shot for a negotiation with Christ. They didn't have anything else. That was it. Now we encounter the power of the Lord Jesus, right? One word, what is it? Go. Wow. Just think about that. I mean, some of you guys, when you tell your children go, they don't even listen to you, you know what I mean? <laughs> Police officers, you know, they tell cars, go this way, and the cars don't listen. Jesus tells 6,000 demons and they go. What power? They came out. Instant expulsion. 
This is not what people call exorcism. Get out the cross, the beads, a little bit of garlic. Come out, you spirit. Listen, I'm not doing that stuff. I'm not messing with that stuff. I'm not going anywhere near that stuff. Stand my ground. What should you do if you encounter a demon? For us, give the word of God. Speak the word of God to the person. Lead them to Christ. That is all the power that's needed there. This is just, this is not, extra. it's like we say, was Jesus a faith healer? No. Jesus never healed anybody by faith. Jesus healed people by the power of God, not by faith. People get that messed up. Jesus was not an exorcist. He used his power to cast out demons. Go. There's no exorcism. They're just, leave. Now. Obey. That's God's power. And they came out. Instant expulsion. And instant entry into the swine. So they're over there, what, 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet? And they're in there, and immediately the swine start going crazy. That tells me that spirits are swift travelers. They move very fast. Wow. And they, they enter into the swine, and the whole herd goes crazy. They start running down the steep bank towards the Sea of Galilee, go right into the waters, and they all drown. Swift Swine suicide. All gone. Maybe this shows that the demons themselves did not know how the pigs would react when they went in. They hadn't had that experience before. Why did the Lord permit this? I don't know. Maybe it was a teaching device. Letting the craziness of the pigs be an illustration to the disciples and to us about what the true character of a demon is. Do you like that? Do you think that's cool to be like a demon? To put the picture of a demon on the back of your pickup truck and be cool and tough? It's, it's stupid. Why on earth do people boast about being like demons? Maybe also Jesus just thought that unclean animals was a suitable place for unclean spirits. Pigs, according to Leviticus 11.7 and Deuteronomy 14.8, were unclean animals. Maybe the Lord knew what the demons did not know, that the pigs would not be able to sustain them. They'd go crazy and they would be off into the desert regions again. Now, just in case there are any of uh, animal rights sympathizers here this morning, poor little piggies, or on the opposite, meat lovers, what a bunch of wasted bacon, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Please remember that um, these, just get this point, Two men were more important to the Lord Jesus Christ than a whole herd of pigs. And if it helps your sensitivities, please remember these pigs were destined for slaughter anyway. What happened to the demons once the pigs drowned? Started roaming around in the air again. Legion was off on the loose. You see Stephen King pick up on that in his, his uh, novel. It got turned into a movie. I think it was A Perfect Storm or something like that where a legion would show up on an island off of the coast of Maine, and there he is, he's still on the loose, he's still doing his thing. We don't know where he is now. Probably still is on the loose. Demons have been around a long time. They're far more intelligent than we are, though not than God. They are more powerful than we are, but not than Christ. They can even perform limited signs and wonders. Some are displayed at times in pagan religion. Yet with one command, Jesus tells them where to go. And here we encounter the key lesson. Jesus said it himself in Luke eleven twenty: If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. I am the king, and I have authority over all. Learn the lesson. Please notice that Jesus did not rely on any incantation, no slow process of exercising the spirits, no drink this, por this potion and everything will be fine. Jesus used his own power. Remember Mark 1, 27, they were amazed. What is this? A new teaching with authority. Jesus commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. That was not what the exorcists of their day did. Do we in the church, you and I, have that same power that Jesus had today? Answer, no. 
No more than we have the same healing power that Christ had. Well, what should we do? I already said it. When the devil comes to you, you resist him and he will flee. We're told to put on the full armor of God and stand our ground against the schemes of the devil, Ephesians 6, verses 10 and following. The church is never instructed to engage in a demon exorcism ministry. When you turn to the epistles that give the church its marching orders and you read about the life of the church in the book of Acts, you find nothing at all about the church itself carrying on a ministry of exorcism. You find many exhortations to ministry. All kinds of ministries we are to do. It was already hinted at in our announcement. But not, here's one way to serve in your local church, start an exorcism ministry. Very few had the authority to cast out demons even in the days of the apostles. And it was always associated with an apostle. Here Jesus was doing it as a sign of the kingdom to demonstrate his power as king. After him, Casting out demons was a sign of an apostle. It was called miracles, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. And that was not given to us. But we are to stand firm against the devil. Now, third and last, we come to the aftermath of the conflict, so to say. The plea for the people. This is our third stage. The plea from the people, verses 33 and 34. The herdsmen ran away and went to the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniacs. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. It was very interesting to them, right? And when they saw him, they implored him to leave their region. What? What is that? The Bible often contains wrong responses of people to God or to Jesus or to a prophet. Why? That we may learn from bad examples. Three wrong responses of these people. First of all, the herdsmen ran away and they went to the city and reported everything. Why didn't they just first come to Jesus and find out who he was? Second, when the whole city came out to meet Jesus, they did not even give Jesus the respect that the demons had given. If you're going out to meet a man who just conquered evil, doesn't it make sense that his great power over evil means he's good, very good and powerful, a righteous man? Go give him respect. Mark 5 says that when they came out to see Jesus, they were not angry. They were scared because they saw the demon-possessed man in his right mind and clothed. They weren't even upset about losing the pigs, as far as we know. They were concerned about the power of Jesus itself and were scared about it. His display of power was not something they could control and they didn't want him around. And third... The third wrong response, instead of thanking him for deliverance for these men, solving their highway problem, they begged Jesus, leave our region and never come back. They didn't want to be anywhere near Jesus, just like the demons. They wanted their lives the way they had it. How sad. This region would never see the Lord Jesus in his ministry Again, bad response, foolish response. But there was one who had the right response to Jesus. One, whole city, wrong response. One man or two, right response. This man who had been freed from demon domination. You want to know what he thinks? According to the other Gospels, he said that he wanted to accompany Jesus anywhere Jesus went. You know, the Lord said, the person who's forgiven much loves much. He said, after what I've been through, I'll go anywhere with you. And he wasn't just talking. He had seen what evil was. He had probably flirted with evil, got excited about evil, wanted evil, and then evil came upon him, and it turned out to be something way beyond what he thought it was and tormented. He, was, he had long since learned his lesson. Don't dabble with this stuff. Now he wanted no part of evil again. Here's a holy man. I just want to be next to him for the rest of my life. We don't even know if he had a family, friends, the city. He didn't want to go back to any of them. Please learn from this experience, people. Please listen and learn. Don't touch evil. Don't play with it. 
It's not cute. Don't act like spiritism or the occult or paganism or witchcraft or seances are silly or fun. It's not something to sneeze at. Evil is real. Don't dabble with it. Part of the strategy of the dark one is to let you think that there's nothing there and then to entrap you. There may not be real ghosts haunting houses, but there are conniving and imitating spirits. There may be fake people making a buck off of fortune telling, but the real demon spirits want to become familiar spirits to those involved in such a thing. And the more familiar they become, the more they can possess them. They may call Ouija a game or a movie now, but with God, asking spirits for guidance is no game. It may just seem like a, what is it, PS4 now game? But if it has demons in it and you are trying to act like the demon or seek demonic power, you have already taken a step towards darkness and don't even realize it. Rather, our response should be what this freed man did. He wanted to be as close as he could to Jesus. I hope that's what you want. This man was believing. This man was ready to follow. By the way, he was saved. With all the evil that he did, he's completely saved. If you want to know, how do we know we're saved totally by God's grace? There it is. What did this guy have to offer? You know, I've lived a pretty good life up till now, Lord Jesus. How about taking me along as a disciple? I'm a real student of the scriptures. I was nice to my kids. I give to charity. Now, this man was demon-possessed by 6,000 demons. He had nothing to offer to God. And... The way the Lord responds to him is that he was merciful to him and even used him as a witness in his hometown. We should be like that. We should want to be ready to follow. I don't know, maybe some of you are not ready to follow Christ. You're still enjoying your evil. Why? You think it's, you think it's fun? You think it's going to help you? you? Think you're going anywhere with that? Believe Christ. Say no to the evil. Say no to what is evil in your life. Reject your life and follow Christ. That's what he did. Jesus knew that their rejection of him in that region meant that they still needed a witness in that region. And so he told this man, no, I don't want you to follow me. That doesn't mean that he didn't accept him as a believer, just in the physical sense of following him. He told him, go and give your testimony to everybody in that region. And he did that. He went around giving his testimony because everybody knew about him and everybody would listen to what he had to say. And so the foolish decision, hopefully in the future, turned into salvation for some of those people there. Go home to your people, Jesus said, and report what great things God has done for you and the mercy he has shown to you. Sometimes when nobody will listen to the Bible or talk about Jesus, you can at least say, well, let me tell you what God did for me. We call that a testimony. Do you have a testimony? Has God done something merciful for you? Were you headed in the wrong direction? Did he save you? You have a testimony. Use your testimony. Use your testimony. Go tell people. Go tell your family. Go tell your friends. Go tell your coworkers. Go tell the guy at the bus stop next to you. Just go tell him. Tell him what great things God has done for you. That's a good thing to do. Witness for Christ. We need to witness for Christ because these are dark times. Would you agree? God has uh, put you as a light exactly where you are, right where you are. You're there. I'm not there. You're there. One of the other pastors is not there. You're there. You're placed there by God providentially. And you, you may wish your Christian life were a lot stronger, but you are a light right where you are. Shine. Darkness has been creeping into our land for quite some time, hasn't it? And it's, uh, it's coming in. It seems like it's just rushing in the front doors now. You know, the sun may shine brightly outside today, but uh, darkness is creeping into our land. And you are lights. You need to shine. That's what lights do. Shine. Ephesians 5, 8. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 
1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night and not of darkness. 1 Peter 2.9. Proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You're in it. Proclaim God's excellencies. Pastor, you don't know my coworkers. I don't need to know your coworkers. I just need to know that you're light. Yeah, but I'm not sure they'll listen. You're not responsible for whether or not they listen. You're responsible for whether or not you talk. Talk. And by the way, October the 31st is a good day. It is a day the Lord has made. It is not the devil's day. It's God's day. And you tell people that. This is the day God has made. And God has authority over the devil. And you take back that day. and Quit cowering in a corner. Go speak the word of God to people. Amen? Amen. Draw your sword out and go charge. That's the Bible, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Don't go killing anyone. <laughs> the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Go use it. Well, who's going to listen to me? They don't have to listen to you. Listen to the Bible. Give them a verse. You're people of the light. Amen? Amen. Father, give us courage and boldness that we live under the banner of the Son of God who commands demons and they shudder before Him. Remind us of these things, Lord, and help us not to even put a toe in these occultic practices. Guard our children and our teens. Knock some sense into them, Lord, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.